So could you just tell us a little bit about your your introduction to, to music before you as a DJ, how you, you know, you, your, uh, your tastes were honed, what was the music, who were your influences? I think unconsciously as a kid growing up in the South Bronx, um, I used to sit in elementary school, I used to doodle, draw, sketch, anything. And so um, my folks, the, way, the best way to keep me quiet, give Frankie a, a pencil and he's all good. You know, and so what would happen is that when I'd come home from school, I'd sit there and, and the stereo would be on, my sister's stereo would be on, and I'm just listening to whatever music she's playing or whatever, you know, and just sketch it. And I would sketch all day, all night. You know, and she's playing whatever, or I'm listening to whatever she's, you know. And I think those were the things that actually probably was pushing me along, but I didn't realize it. I mean, everything from West Montgomery to um, uh, Sergio Mendez in Brazil 66, and, you know, a lot of jazz, and then, you know, the Motown stuff that I would hear on the street anyway. So it was a lot of that. And um, by the time I got into high school, high school of art and design, um, Doing, whenever I had to sit down and do homework, or I had to work on a project in school, I'm listening to music. But um, by the time I got into like the 11th grade, you know, I learned what it was to go out and hang out. And I'm running around with Larry LeVan at this particular point, you know, and um, finding all, discovering all these clubs and all this nightlife and stuff. So he took me to the loft for the very first time. There you have it. <laughs> so um, 11th grade, hanging out with Larry Levant. I mean, how old is someone when they're in the Oh, uh, 16, 17. So you were 16. hanging out with Larry Levant at the loft when you were 16 years old. Well, I, I met Larry actually when I was 14, uh, 14 years old. So I might have been still in junior high school or something like that. And uh, by the time I got into high school, uh, yeah, then I began to run the streets with him. <laughs> and uh, he was DJing then? No, neither one of us were DJing. What happened was, um, Hanging out at the loft, um, it was the first time I, the first time I had hung out there. David Mancuso was planning on taking a vacation at the end of that summer, and what the loft would have been closing. So there was a, another friend of mine that was working for Nikki Siena at the gallery, which was the loft's, I guess, direct competition, if you will, even though there was really no such thing. And he was getting ready to go. This friend of mine was getting ready to go into the into the Air Force. But he had spoke to Nikki and said, listen, I have a friend of mine that can take my place here if you don't mind. You know, and so Nikki said, yeah, well, I need someone here. And so then he introduced me to Nikki outside of David's loft that night. And um, I reported to work the following weekend. And the job basically was for me to set up the fruit bar and decorate, you know, blowing up balloons, this and the other, some of everything. And then I brought Larry there afterwards. That's how Larry came to work there as well. Right. And then Larry did more, spent more time hanging out in the booth with Nikki. And uh, I just kind of sort of hung in the periphery and stuff. And was that when you started to, to DJ at the bathhouse? And... Well, why, it's interesting. While I was working at the gallery, at Nikki's gallery, uh, T. Scott, who was playing at a club called Better Days at the time, and T. Scott was one of the big DJs in New York at the time as well, um, had asked me to come and play on Monday and Tuesday nights because he was playing five days a week and now the club was going to expand and go seven days a week. But he didn't want to do the extra day, so he asked me if I would come and do it. Now mind you, I had never played ranks at that particular point. Granted, I hung around the booth, I hung out with Nikki. we were close. Um, but Larry worked more hands-on than I did. You know, and T asked me if I would come and do it, and I was like, listen, I don't have any records, I can't do it, I don't think I have the ability to do it. And he was like, you know all the music, you can use my records, I'll let you use my, you know, that kind of thing. And I was like, well, if you think so. But I could use the money as well, you know what I mean? Because <laughs> I'm in high school, I mean, I'm young, there are things I want, things I want to do, I want to look cute. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want to be fabulous like everybody else, you know, uh, so I took the job. Uh, I did it for about six months and then they shut the night back down because they said there was no, no one coming. So, you moved to Chicago. Why, why the move to Chicago? Well, um, I had, after I left Better Days, I worked at Continental Bass for like about five years with Larry. And I went there as Larry's light man because Larry got the residency, and so he invited me to come and do lights for him. And back in the day, that's how you got a job. If you're gonna work as a DJ, you, if you can get a job as a light man, then you can ultimately become a DJ one day because you're right there with the music all the time anyway. 
and sooner or later the, the DJ is going to have to go to the bathroom and he might not make it back in time. So <laughs> you might have to change that record and you better know how to do it. So that's pretty much how it happened. But um, while we were there, a couple of years after we were there, Richard, we were working with Richard Long as apprentices. So he was teaching us everything about sound. And he had, he didn't do the sound system, he didn't install the sound system for Continental Bass, but he taught us everything about it. Um, he, because his, his theory was, listen, if you guys are going to play music, then you need to know how to drive your equipment. And you need to know everything about it. It's like being a mechanic. You need to know what you're dealing with. Um, so that we wouldn't kill people on the dance floor, that kind of thing, or sever their heads because the hides are too much of this, that, and the other. At the same time, Richard was ultimately turning his showroom into a nightclub. And he asked Larry to uh, do the residency there. So Larry left, and I ended up with the uh, residency at Continental, Continental Bass. But to backtrack a little bit, just to answer your question, uh, Robert Williams actually wanted Larry for the warehouse in Chicago. I was second choice, but I didn't mind. Okay. I had nothing else. To, <laughs> I had nothing else to do. I mean, at that particular point, Continental Bass had went bankrupt. It closed down. I mean, I was playing different places, but I wasn't happy anywhere that I was at. And at what point did the soundtrack of the warehouse evolve from disco, South Soul, Philly International into house? And what was really the catalyst for that? Uh, if to look back on it now, it probably became more visible by the time I opened up the power plant, by the time I left the warehouse and opened up the power plant on my own. Uh, it was pretty well defined then. I had already met Jamie, I'd already done my first remix, and uh, around me people like Steve Silk Hurley and Marshall Jefferson, these guys were working on tracks of their own. And a lot of them had put out a lot of tracks long before I put out anything. Right. Yeah. But that's what they were, they were just a lot of tracks that... So is it, it, was it just a moment in time when, when a lot of producers all of a sudden were influenced by the same thing, technology kind of happened and all of a sudden th this style of music was being made simultaneously? I mean, were these people connected? Did they speak to each other or were they all making the music independent? You know, I don't know how well any of them knew each other. I mean, apparently they were all hanging out at the warehouse and I didn't know. You know, I mean, the warehouse was only open one day a week, it was on Saturday night, and all my focus went into that Saturday night, and I mean, I'm, I'm playing from midnight to noon the next day. And occasionally I would do, you know, a marathon where it's like 24 hours. You know what I mean? Uh, I did that maybe three or four times. Uh, but all those guys were hanging out, I didn't know. I didn't know who they were nice. at the time. You know, uh, and apparently they were watching me pretty close. But uh, a lot of the music that they were trying to put together was based on a lot of the stuff that I was playing. By the time I had done the remix of Let No Man Put Us Under for First Choice, things had turned around at that point. I'm also working in a record store. Then I meet Jamie. Start so working with Jamie. You know, Jamie came into the record store one day with his cassette and asked me if I would consider producing him. And I had never produced anything other than that one remix before that. But I told him, I was like, if you trust me enough to do it, then hey, I, I'll take the leap of faith. Why not? There's a story that I, I read actually in a book by Cheryl Garrett. Cheryl uh, Garrett. Wow. You remember her? She was. Uh, she was a really close face. friend of mine, and she, I, I don't know where she's at in this world. And she. she in oh, the we book were really quotes tight. That um, when everybody entered the warehouse, they were given an acid tab. And during the course of the night, now this may be true, I'm just asking you if this happened, because it's a great story. Mm -hmm. um, everyone was given an acid tab, whether they chose to take it or not is, is another thing. Mm -hmm. But at one point you would just completely stop the music, cut all the lights so the room was pitch black, and there would be a, the noise of a train going through the sound system, and everybody freaked out. That's half true. That's half true. That's half true. One, um, no one was given a tab of acid when they came through the front door. Now, they sorted that out on their own. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I did a lot of environmental things in that room. Uh, I could be very experimental with it. So there would be points in the evening where, you know, I mean, the energy level is so high, you know, that I felt maybe I need to give these people a chance to catch up to themselves. So this, the song that's playing will fade out and then, or it would fade right into a rainstorm or something like that. And then we turn on the uh, exhaust fans and the heat in the room would just completely disappear. It would just cool off and people felt like they were actually in the dark, right. in a rainstorm. So you can hear it and then all of a sudden you hear the thunder and this, that and the other and it would get really, really intense. And then as the rain began to subside and stuff like that, you can hear a train in the distance. 
And then all of a sudden, it would just like come right through that room and pit, and people go running, but they would run into the walls, they would run into <laughs> themselves. You know, they couldn't see what they were doing, they couldn't see where they were going. But, yes. you know, in the cold light of the morning, the next day when it's all over and done with, people are standing around <laughs> outside just talking about that train, that train, that train, that train. <laughs> You know, and sometimes I'd have to wait for people to really leave because I couldn't get out of the club because they would just rush me. Some of them loving it, some of them lost their minds on it, you know, and especially if, you know, if they're tripping like that. You think you're really seeing these things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, it was half true. Okay. Or partially, anyway. <laughs> Actually, yes, that embellishes it just perfectly. So. <laughs> and so, you moved to New York at that point. You moved back to New York? Shortly thereafter. And... I, the next kind of phase of your career, I, I feel, started with the, the productions that you were involved with. Well, I did a little bit of production in Chicago before I left. Uh, un understood. You know, I mean, uh, the original version of Move Your Body, I, did, I mixed that for Marshall Jefferson. Uh, and then there was a host of little small records that came out on tracks that I had done. You know, I mean, I, was, I never got paid for any of that work, but the education was the pay. You know what I mean? I figured, the more time I could spend in the studio and the more time, you know, the more time I spent there, I would learn and I would eventually be able to take that somewhere. So by the time I left Chicago going to New York City, uh, record companies and A&R people were coming out of the woodwork asking me to do things for them. And I just happened to get in at Def Mix on the ground floor coming through the front door with all of this. So it, it, it balanced out. So that was how you, how you, your association with Def Mix started. And obviously for people that, are, you know, Def Mix is a, um, was a production remix DJ organization which consisted of yourself, David Morales, later Weinstein. on Satoshi Tomi, and it was managed by, by Judy Weinstein. Yes. The company actually really just belonged to Judy and David. You know, um, I became, I'm not really an officer in the company, I became a client of the company and also you know, David and I were partners in the studio. But I think because I had made so much of a name for myself up until that particular point, I'm attracting all this work that's coming in, and David wasn't getting the respect, you know what I mean, which wasn't fair, I didn't think, because I know he, he worked as hard as I did, and I watched him, and we did so much stuff together. You know, but eventually, he and I had to kind of separate in order for him to get his. And, and, and the chemistry between you and David, how did, how did that work? Who was responsible for, for what specific part of the music making process? We were both equally... Uh, responsible for it. It's interesting because we'd be at that SNL board, that SSL board, excuse me, uh, in the studio, and he'd take the top thing where all the percussion is and the drums, because that's mainly his thing. Uh, at least it was at the time. And I'd be at the bottom end of the board where all the vocals are and the harmonics and the, all the pretty stuff. <laughs> and I'm down here. And so, you know, uh, the main controls of an SSL board is like right in the center. So we'd work our way to the center. I'd do all my, you know, mutes and this, that, and the other down here. He's doing his thing up there. And then eventually we meet in the middle and we just fuse it all together. And you get something like Where Love Lives by Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, I mean, you know, the discography of records that you were involved with at that period of time is, is pretty extensive. <laughs> um, I never think about it, but yeah, it is right. Uh, well, and you know, and there were certain, you know, there are certain records that you remember the first time that you heard those records. And if it would be Where Love Lives was one of them, The Sounds of Blackness, your remix of The, the Pressure, pressure yeah. which is, you know, there's the, that was the, the house mix with, the, with the chord intro, which was amazing. There was the disco vibe to it. It was just a timeless piece of music. Yeah. And tears. I mean, we sent a tweet out to the defected followers and asked them uh, if they had any specific questions for you. And people responded and said, how did tears come about? Um, it was in 1988. I went to Japan for the first time uh, on tour. And actually, it was a special tour for Shiseido. It was a promotional gig for Shiseido. They were launching a new line of products just for men. And uh, they booked me to come and play all these events. And then, so I was gonna be in Japan for a month. And the first gig was in Tokyo. Um, and they had this kid that was playing keyboards that would play like a, a fanfare or something like that just before I'd come on to play. And that kid was Satoshi Tomi. Yeah. Uh, never spoke a word of English before that, but uh, we started communicating through an interpreter. And uh, I kept saying, you know, we need to work on some music together. 
and he agreed and so when I got back home to New York we continued to talk back and forth over the phone with an interpreter and um, he said he had some ideas about a song and stuff and he posted the cassette to me that had the outline of tears and I fell in love with it and I was playing the cassette at the world and everywhere else and um, so Judy said you know you should really turn this into a song because everybody was talking about it now. And a, a couple of years later, probably your biggest commercial success, the track called The Whistle Song. <laughs> there's, when you first hear that record, there's actually nothing in that record that makes you feel that's a record that's going to get played on the radio. No, not that at all. That it's going to be a hit. Not at all. And yet it was an enormous success. I mean, who how? knew? I didn't. I definitely didn't. You know, at this particular point, I was uh, I was being courted to sign a record deal here in here in England uh, with Virgin, and I'm thinking, okay, this is going to be great. You know, mind you, I'm the first DJ that's actually being given a record deal, and I'm starting to write music for it. You know, and the first person I started working with was Eric Cooper, and Eric tossed out the idea of it and stuff. You know, and I thought, and at the same time this is going on, Junior Vasquez walks out of the Sound Factory, and Bill Smith, who who was Junior's partner there called me up and said, Junior walked out, are you available to play a sound factory this Saturday? And I was like, yeah, okay. I'm excited about it. You know, I'm like, yeah, okay. And I'm in the studio now, and I'm working on the whistle song. So I'm thinking, I gotta have one particular song that's going to make the biggest impact on Saturday night. And when I put it on at the sound factory, people took to it in a way, it was, it just blew up. It just blew up. It did more than I expected it to. I think it did more than most of us expected it to. They were asking for it for the Lift and Ice Tea commercial and this, that, and the other. And I don't think any of us was prepared for what was going on. So you mentioned Eric Kappa, and obviously he's a, an amazing keyboard player. And was there, was there was there anybody else? I mean, was there anyone that? Because you know the sound of that time and, and the productions that were coming out were very distinctive. It, you know, amazingly produced. Was it? I mean, anyone that played percussion in particular, or was there it... was a couple of people that played, played percussion. Morale did percussion for me a couple of times. Um, there's this gentleman by the name of Bashiri Johnson who's worked with everybody from Michael Jackson to Whitney, this that, and the other. Um, one of the great things uh, was all these people are session musicians and session singers. I mean, when I really started writing songs and producing songs. I mean, I bring my own background vocals in, and usually nine times out of ten, they would be either Mariah's background girls or Luther's background girls and guys. And you know, they, they all live in New York City and they're session musicians, and that's what they do. That's how they make a living. So, do you think it's it's part of the reason that the records sounded like they did back in those days, and that they were they were successful, and not just on the dance floor but on the radio as well, was down to the fact that you utilize real singers, real musicians, and you put the whole soundscape together. Fast track to today, everyone's just making records on, on their laptops. Well, you know, we would, I think, um, we were the last of a dying breed. We were the last to come down the pike that actually worked in real recording studios uh, with live musicians and, and, and singers and full on production. When you listen to you know, a production like The Sounds of Blackness, The Pressure, and so like that, it's huge. You know, and then the way everything was mastered after we finished it, you know, I mean, it's just big. Now everything is pretty much done you know, in these, on these guys' laptops or in their bedroom, and most of them don't know the first thing about producing a song. You know what I mean? I think if they had some kind of education in a real live room, you know, or even if they just took their production and put it in the hands of a real engineer. You know what I mean? Having a second set of fresh ears to take it to that next level, I think it will come across so much bigger than what it does. But they limit themselves. I often have the discussion with people that their argument is there's no sales, so what's the point of us investing? And my argument is if you invest, you'll get the sales. And it's a chicken and egg, egg situation. But um, I guess there's no real answer until... Well, I tell you, uh, being on this side of it, uh, I stopped producing and remixing for a very long time. And still, I would go shopping, looking for music, and had great difficulty finding things that really appealed to me. It's not enough for me to just throw out there whatever is available. 
You know, for me, each song that I play has got to be just as great as the last one that was on before it. You know, so shopping around and trying to find music that's going to essentially make a difference is really, really different. The difficult, excuse me. So when I got asked to do Hercules and the Love Affair, for example, that's what pulled me back into it. Because at that particular point, I figured, okay, listen, if I'm going to do this, then I have to be able to do it at a level that's comfortable for me. And I don't care whether I make money at it or not. You know what I mean? Because that's not what it's about. The fact that the quality of music had gone down so far that this particular end of the business was beginning to get very disrespected all the way around. I mean, you can't get arrested or you can't swing a dead cat and hit, you know, a, you know, a, a house record in the United States that's making a significant difference. You know what I mean? And to me, as a DJ, that being missed in the room said a lot. So when everyone gravitated towards Blind the way they did, blew my mind. And then I just figured at that particular point, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this the way I want to do it. I, know, I mean, I've got the experience. I know exactly how to make these records. I know how, exactly how to make these songs work. But I have to make sure that the song is there first. I'm determined to make sure that that's there first. You know what I mean? And I'll put it together. Either it's going to work or it's not going to work. But it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Because I'm not trying to get rich doing it. That's not the reason why I do it. You know, I just think that quality music, especially when you're in a nightclub under a beautiful sound system, is essential. It's necessary. Somebody's got to do it. And actually, just um, digressing a, a, a little, because you mentioned Hercules and Love Affair. And I think the, 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 the true sound of house is almost coming back with an act like Herc Hercules and Love Affair. You know, what Absolutely. is, where, where is that scene coming from? Is it a It's New the York next generation. It's the next generation. It is. I was actually surprised when they asked me to do it. When I first heard it, I didn't hear it. Like, I, was, I wasn't into it, you know, and then I got sick, I got ill, um, and I told them I wouldn't be able to do it. You know, I did it as a favor for a friend, but I told them I wouldn't be able to do it because I was going to be out of it for a while. They said they would wait. They waited nine months. When I got well and I got back to work, they came and it was like, would you do it now? I promised I would do it when I got well. I did the mix, knocked it out, sent it to them, left and went on the road, didn't think about it. By the time I got halfway through that tour, the song was out and people knew it and I didn't know. And everybody was really into it. I think it was, a, you know, it's, it's That's what a sound and it. an element of dance music that people had, had missed, you know. And, uh, I didn't realize how much it had been missed. I mean, I knew that I had been missing something on the dance floor and a sound that that's like the nucleus of this business, you know what I mean? There was a period where no matter how many different genres or offshoots were coming out and stuff like that, still at the center was, you know, um, a sound that had a great amount of soul to it and a great amount of vocal and, uh, you know, and, and, and stories being told and something that you can sink your teeth into, you know what I mean? And then all of a sudden it was gone. You know, for a long period of time, it was gone. It was your hard house and your New York hard house and this, that, and the other, and your trans, yada, 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 yada. Hey, look, I'm not knocking any of it, but it's always been a situation where it will go around and then it will come back around. And then it was beginning to come back around and there was nothing there. And that's what scared me. Well, you know, I would just, I would like to finish by saying that, you know, the dance scene has become very commercial and very overground in the last few years and you know the, the the scene that we grew up in was n was never that way it was more underground it was more about groups of people and communities connecting Community. with each other and Community. that seems to have over the last four or five years have been lost to some degree even though people speak to each other much more on a regular basis now with the internet etc it seems that the communities or the small pockets of people that would break certain records in certain areas and then they would then go, you know, cross over into other areas, which is what, where the, the term crossover used to come from. Mm -hmm. It would cross out of being a club record into, being into the mainstream. Pop record or whatever, yeah, sure. But from what the last few months I'm seeing, those communities are coming back. And for me, it's a, actually a very exciting time because there is a me real too. divide coming between what is the ultra commercial side of dance music at this moment mm -hmm. and the more indulgent, soulful, underground, where kids don't want to be hit over the head for eight or nine hours right. in a club. 
And I think that those kids are your people like Hercules and Love Affair. Mm -hmm. And they want to know about Frankie Knuckles. They want to know about where the music that they are inspired by mm -hmm. has come from. And you know, you were one of the people making that sound, you were there at the beginning. So I believe that for people like yourself, there's a whole new generation of people that want to hear the story again. So I don't know what your future for the next five years holds, but I reckon it's going to be good. I hope so. I really do. I really hope so. Um, I have too much fun doing what I do. Um, there's a, I think that there's a demographic out here that gets overlooked all the time. Um, and these are our contemporaries that I'm talking about, you know, and when our contemporaries start coming back out again because there's music they can sink their teeth into, makes them feel good and reminds them of where they came from, you know, um, then it becomes bigger than what it is now because you've got where they came from with what's going on now. And today's youth, if you will, gets a lesson, you know, on what this is and what this is about. You know, uh, they begin to realize it's a lot more than just fluff. You know what I mean? Radio is radio and it's going to always be that. But there is an element of the nightlife where there's a main road that everybody goes down and then there's that little shack over there on the side that, you know, only a select amount of people know how, exactly how good it is and that's where they go. Because even when this main commercial club closes, that one's still open. When their day comes to an end, this one is just really getting started. You know what I mean? And that's where all the best music usually is, you know? And some of these people will find their way over there, you know, and begin to learn exactly what it's all about. I mean, and that's pretty much what, what it was like growing up in Chicago and playing at the warehouse. I mean, the bars were closed and people were like, well, there's this place downtown. <laughs> you know, and they would come there and they begin to realize, wow, this has been here all this time, I had no idea. You know, some things, you know, not everything has to be on the main road, you know what I mean? Sometimes you find Paradise, paradise in just the smallest places, but it can be so much bigger than what it, what it usually is. You know, and I think so much is fueled out of that that makes this big commercial thing happen the way it does. You know, um, me being able to make music again the way I'm doing it, I'm having so much fun doing it. And so, this is where I'm at, and, this is, and I'm very happy for where I am. You know, and I think uh, reinventing myself and what I'm doing with Director's Cut uh, and the way people are embracing it, 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 it's a very lovely thing. And I think that's a great way to say thank you very much, Mr. Frankie Knuckles. Thank you, my friend. <laughs>